First of all, um, hello everybody and um, thank you very much for this. Thank you for inviting me to chair this question and answer. My name is Malcolm Wren. I'm in York in the north of England and I think one of the reasons I was asked to be involved Alert from this, calendar. First day of Black History Month. Oh, by the way, it's first day of Black History Month. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And Sorry. Gay History Month, I think. Um, <laughs> the, um, one of the reasons I think I was asked to do this was the time involved in running a small charity um, based here in York. We support LGBT plus asylum seekers in the north of England. Maybe it's worth explaining to those of you in the States, the system with asylum and refugees is slightly different in the UK to the US. Here, people on the whole find their way here and then claim asylum and have to wait stuck in the system often for years until the Home Office decides whether they believe that they have a good reason to be granted refugee status. People who are claiming asylum on the grounds of sexual orientation or uh, gender identity have real problems in persuading people of the truth of their stories. Many of them are fleeing from their families, um, parents who have threatened or attacked their children uh, because of the risk to family honor. Many of them are fleeing their communities, their neighbors, and many of them are fleeing their churches, I'm sorry to say. Um, and so I'm very interested in the work that you've been doing and the, um, the film you're putting together. It also brings back memories of my own youth um, as a student of theology, as a conservative Christian myself at that time. And these things in many ways are getting worse for some people. So these are issues that are to do with human rights, but they're also issues connected with equality and people feeling at risk from all sorts of things. So uh, that's why I'm here and I'm looking forward to hearing different accounts from different people. So can we ask um, Rocky first to say a bit about the project and what we're doing? Sure, and thank you so much for having us. And I was really excited, Malcolm, for you to uh, host this panel and that we can expand this conversation together now across the pond. So this is really exciting. Uh, and I hope that after this panel, we can continue the conversation and see how we can work together because the 1946, the mistranslation that shifted culture is the name of the movie, but it's more than a movie. This is very important work that we feel this is just a starting point of the conversation. And obviously there have been people before us that have, that have been doing this work. And so we just are so grateful to even have an opportunity to, to be in this space. But the movie is specifically about a mistranslation of the Bible in 1946 in the Revised Standard Version of the word homosexual with two Greek words, Malakoin or Sinekoitai, they were conjoined. And our researchers, who we have one of them here today, Kathy Baldock, the lovely author, Kathy Baldock, uh, and then a gentleman called Ed Oxford, who wanted to ask the question, who made this decision and why? Was it ideological and cultural? And um, is it a product of anti-gay theology? And so they trace the origins of anti-gay theology and discrimination of the LGBTQ community in the church to this mistranslation. We explore the mistranslation. So the thesis of the movie is more about 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. But then we do look at the spread of the word into other translations and verses. And uh, our goal of the film is to get people to understand it's facts over feelings, which is why I wore my facts over feelings today. We are leading with academic integrity and humility for the 
for both for everyone involved in this because it's a it's a heartbreaking situation and so we try to finesse these notes understanding both sides uh, and the hurt around it and present just a journalistic point of view that leads the audience wanting to ask more questions and obviously not profit not popping propaganda at them. So that's my vision as the director. I feel very strongly that we've hit those notes. We're in now our last uh, leg of the production, like finishing phase. We're in technical post-production, the movie structured. We got through development, production, structuring. Now we've got to get through technical post, animation, color correction, sound design, all that stuff. So that's my little two seconds of the <laughs> what we're doing at 1946. Thank you very much indeed. And um, can we ask Kathy to tell us a bit about her involvement in it? And um, I, the, I've certainly seen her on the clip that was shared with us beforehand. I don't know if, uh, if we're going to get a chance to see more of that later, um, mm -hmm. but it was, it was lovely to meet you um, on that. So tell us about yourself. Uh, well, I, I, I think I was very typical of the evangelical community where I believed what was told to me from the pulpit. And um, I, I just accepted what was told to me without doing any sort of research. And I think that's probably very typical. We know that there's verses in the Bible that we believe speak against homosexuality. And I just believed along with the rest of my tribe. And then uh, in 2000, I started to go through a divorce. And the way I coped with the divorce was, um, I did two things. I took Italian because I, I, I painted my house, all the walls, different colors. I took Italian because intellectually it's the most difficult thing I can do is languages because I wanted to keep my brain busy. And I also every day started hiking. I live in this beautiful area near Lake Tahoe and I started hiking and the trails weren't as heavily used then, this is 20 years ago. And I ran into a woman and I suspected right away she was a lesbian, Neto Montoya. And um, I wanted to hike with her because she hiked about the same pace and I saw her every Saturday. So I started hiking with her and in hiking with her, she, ch she didn't tell me she was gay, but I believe she was gay from the language she was using. She'd never talk about a uh, husband or men or, but the thing was at that time, she was a safe place for me because I was not allowed to talk about my divorce, pending divorce to anyone in our circle because we had a business together, my husband and I, and <clears throat> he didn't want the business to be financially impacted. So I obeyed, I wouldn't do that today. It wasn't healthy, but I took my frustrations and pain out by going hiking every day. And I really went there to really, to think and to cry. And I come across this woman who's outside of everything that I hold in my friendships, Native American, dark-skinned, Hispanic last name, agnostic, and I find out a year later, a lesbian. I, I pretty much knew she was. <clears throat> and it's just really odd that that is who I trusted with my emotions because my church friends were not a safe place. They would gossip, otherwise known as sharing prayer requests, right? So. Um, I became friends with Neto and in becoming friends with her, that relationship changed the way that I saw LGBTQ people. And in the Italian class I took the very first night, I was paired up with the only gay man in the class for my speaking partner for the year. So all of a sudden within five weeks, I had two gay people right in my life. And, and I needed that. I needed to see relationships. So I knew what was said about these people. So with it, it, it didn't happen right away. It took me five years to say, I wonder what the Bible says about this. So I went on a journey in 2007 to try to figure this out. And that's the beginning of it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I just ask, have other people seen this clip or can we show it now of, of you meeting Neto? Uh, would this be a good time? Uh, 
So thank you very much. For those who um, haven't street, uh, downloaded it themselves, I mean, the, the, the quality is better than that on, on this machine. Obviously, we don't see, see you at your best. Um, but it's, um, I have to say, I was very impressed by the way that's put together. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, the, before we move on and ask other things, I, I'd like, um, I have a question uh, to Cathy. Um, about the, the way that you said you saw the rainbow colours. Um, and I have a question about flags. I'm someone that doesn't like flags, and I, do, I don't really like the rainbow flag, because I think all flags are, are clay, seem to me to be against somebody else. It's us, not them. And even the rainbow flag, it seems to me, although it claims to be inclusive and bringing everybody together, often doesn't work like that. It often alienates people or they, it attracts hostility. Could I ask you how you felt about that and how you feel about other markers, for example, on the other side, crosses and fishes and so on? Well, at the time, all it said to me was that, well, it it didn't tell me she was a lesbian. I didn't have, I didn't have big thoughts around it, but I suspected because I knew I would never put rainbow anything on anything I had because that was, you know, anti-Christian. But in terms of, I, I don't fly any rainbow things around my house and tend not to wear anything when I go to conferences, but, <clears throat> That's more my personality that I'm not sort of a following type. I don't do trends. I don't do anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but I will say when you say about crosses and flags, for me personally, <clears throat> if I walk into a church and the American flag is prominent, I probably will not um, do anything beyond just walk into that church, do what I'm supposed to do and get out. I don't like that cross between <clears throat> the symbols of Christianity and nationalism at all. But I don't have um, opposition to rainbow flags. I just personally don't do any of that in my life. I, I, don't, I don't tend to do much of anything like that in my life. But, but I am opposed to flags and churches very much, very much. Any other comments on anything about that or any other questions for, for Kathy? Um, I've got a question. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for, um, for, for sharing your story and, and sharing your thoughts. Um, have you found on the journey that you've made um, so far with, with your research and, and, and um, you know, with uh, um, the work that you're doing with the film. Uh, how, because obviously like, you know, it, it comes down to a, a, a change of perspective on the inside of, you know, sort of going from what you've been told by the church um, uh, about things that are outside, but how has that affected what the church has told you about yourself as a person? This, there's two parts to it. The first part is the first several years until probably 2015 from 2007 to 2015 is when I was becoming friends with gay people, gay Christians. And I wouldn't say LGBTQ because in the beginning I didn't understand. I would have never understood it, the transgender issue at all. So for me, it was just gay Christians. And then I wrote my first book, Walking the Bridgeless Canyon, and that was a process. And I think I operated on um, a pretty high level at that point. And how it was changing me on the inside was, I know I also became a person that was more gracious towards others. And I was able to then see people more on the edges than my own perspective. When you're in that evangelical, married, heterosexual, homeschooling your children bubble, 
you see only, you only have a, a, a very limited periphery and anything outside of that seems outside of God. And when I started becoming involved in the gay community, those lines were pushed out. And it, it wasn't that I could just see gay people then, I could start to see immigrants. I could start to see other kinds of people, the homeless. I could start to see more kinds of people as I pushed my own borders out. And then when I started on this next project, which began in 2017 when we did the research for the letter, it's not that it pushed out more, it's just that intellectually, I became more confident in what I believed. It wasn't just that these heart tugs were going on that um, I could see others and be more filled with grace. What happened in this latest part of the project was intellectually, academically, scholastically, theologically, I started to rise. And when I started to rise, I feel like I can, on this issue, compete with anyone on the other side of this issue. So I don't just have that, oh, you got to be nice. This is what Jesus wants you to do. I now can feel like I can have conversations at that level. So it's, it's not just pushing my heart out. It's it's expanding my mind so that I can deal with these issues. And I think I can deal with them extremely well now. And I really look forward to not only when the movie comes out, but the corresponding book we're writing that goes along with it, Forging a Sacred Weapon, How the Bible Became Anti-Gay, do out the same time. I feel like the combination of those two is gonna just be really powerful, but I feel like I will be able to uh, engage the very strongest voices of opposition to the LGBTQ Christian community out there. So it's just like this total expansion of my life that would not have happened had I not met Neto. I mean, it really comes down to Neto. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, I'm from the generation of early gay rights in the UK, where one of the basic phrases was the personal is political. Mm -hmm. um, and that meant that there was an obligation on you to be honest to people. They called it coming out, but really it isn't about coming out. It's not, it, it's, it's about not lying. And it is just saying this, this is how things are. Um, and the lesbians at that time particularly felt invisible. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about bringing that visibility and then in relationships, um, establishing this level of engagement. So now my next question is for Rocky really, which, which is to do with, we've seen this example of somebody who who can change, who's, who's locked in a system um, in a polarized world, but has managed to break through. And we are all living, I think possibly even more in the States than here in, in England, you, you are, we are very polarized and tend to be on one side or the other. So I have a question to you. How useful do you find categories like homophobia or hatred? I personally, I have this feeling that disapproval or even theological disapproval isn't necessarily hatred. Do you have anything on this? Sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, you're muted, I think. Yep. Okay. Back on. Um, yeah. Uh, I believe I've always said that our oppressors, they're our parents, they're our cousins, they're our uncles, you know, they're, they go to our, our schools. And so 
in order to really truly understand and empathize with them, I believe that they're victims of bad theology just like we are. And so as we've all been taught this existence for so long, we have to go back to the beginning and pull all the way through, which is what Kathy's work does to really evaluate this. And so that's one of the reasons why I felt this movie was so important after I learned about not only Kathy's research, but then this tangible piece of evidence that has this group of scholars who made this mistranslation admit it was a mistranslation. And so if we can get people to just recognize that the scriptures were written by men and how they came about, you know, if we can just start from this one conversation, uh, then we can maybe start to break down those walls of internalized homophobia and hatred. And I see it every single day on the TikTok um, and people don't think they're homophobic, but the way that they are phrasing their ideology around their, you know, um, uh, own identity is extremely homophobic or, and it's, it's misogyny playing in and patriarchy and these themes that have just consumed our reality for so long. We actually just met a historian that we're um, going to be putting in the movie, a secular Roman historian that we Zoomed with yesterday and really helped just open my understanding more about Corinth and Romans and Paul and Paul's company of all men versus Jesus's company of mostly women and the differences around that. And I think that's going to help expand those conversations, you know? So I, I'm just more encouraged in what Kathy said, as far as like starting to know more, I'm getting more informed now that I've been three years into this and I feel more strongly and I know for sure we're doing the right thing and we are leading with academic integrity and it was a mistranslation. The data supports it. So now we just need to finesse these ideas so people can see it so we can have honest conversations around it. Um, so it's encouraging. One more thing I want to say about that, as far as Kathy said, as her journey has been for many more years than mine, she's also an author. And it's interesting when we hear the anti side um, try to debunk our two and a half minute trailer, <laughs> they make these wild assumptions. And every single one of them, I'm talking about the leading anti LGBTQ theologians in the world have all done YouTube videos about our movie. Not one of them have ever mentioned Kathy's name. Never. So that should tell you right there how deep patriarchy, misogyny, and these roots are. They, if they do mention her, they call her that woman. Mm -hmm. Instead, they, they're, it's so disrespectful. Instead, and she's brilliant, and the work is sound, and it will all be cited in the book. The only thing that they mention is Ed, who's the second gentleman that we saw in the clip, and of course he thinks these things, but he is, he does have an MDiv at Talibet University. He knows what he's talking about. He's lived the experience. And the only thing they say is, well, he comes to those conclusions because of his own biases. And, oh, look, he's so weak in his ideas that he has suicidal ideation. They literally make fun of his suicidal ideation. So I think that their debunking of our film only supports our argument and our claim. It shows exactly the root of this problem, uh, which is patriarchy and misogyny. So I'm encouraged and I can't wait to learn more. And I can't wait for y'all to meet our new uh, scholar that we're considering in the movie too. So anyway. And I just want to refer to, we keep talking about this, the new discovery of information. And what had happened was when I would teach, I would say, I, I do six to eight hour presentations and they're not, they're not boring. I can, I can make them lively. And as I got to the point where the word homosexual was, came into the Bible, I would say it was brought in by this team of translators in 1946, a group of 14 to 15 scholars, you know, just different points of time. And they decided to take two Greek words, combine them and put them into the word homosexual. First time in any Bible, in any translation. And so I would teach this and I would say, I can see from the context to history because I teach along timelines. I, I can see from the context to history that these gentlemen were born between 1870 and 1917. 
So all I had to do was put them in the context of what was understood, like what was understood psychologically about sex, what was understood culturally, what the legal system understood about what it was to be homosexual. And then I could make an assumption what these men knew, because I also knew that there was no anti-gay theology, like theology built around this, uh, actually taking, you know, digging into things and creating theology. There were not even any uh, anti-gay articles in Christian periodicals until the early, until the 70s. And they were flimsy at that. There was theology being created around it. So I could make assumptions that I felt that translation when the, because the point of the translation was to modernize the King James, essentially. And so when they looked into the world around them and my research then showed that they did this translation work in the thirties, in the 1930s, 1939, finalized in 1941, signed off, 1940, signed off, 1941, no changes. And so when they looked into their culture in the forties, they looked and they said, okay, we're trying to modernize this. We have sodomite, male prostitutes, catamites, abusers of themselves with mankind. We know this is abusive sex. We know this is uh, unnatural sex. We know this is pro non-procreative sex. When we look in our world, what is the modern word for that? And the modern word for that to them was homosexual. And so the book comes out, New Testament 46, full Bible 1952, and nobody seems to notice it. And I can prove nobody seems to notice it because I've gone through the archives now three times and 130,000 documents in those archives. And there are only two people that question that translation. One in 1952 says, I've got some gay people. Well, he doesn't say gay. I've got some people in my congregation who have a relative that's a homosexual. Why did you put Arsenikoitai homosexual in, in Corinthians and not in 1 Timothy? And he said, oh, we combined it up. Very superficial answer. But when I went through the archives, when Ed and I went through the archives, that's when I found on the microfilms a series of letters. And the letter was written in 1959. And he, this person named David, writes to the head of the translation team and he says, he writes an academic letter, a five page academic letter and says, you've made a mistake. And it is the first, and we will see only time right through the 1960s that anyone directly challenges the team about that translation. It wasn't an issue because it was still in the fifties even, a crime, a sickness, right? Who cares? The people in that list are bad people. Homosexuals were bad people. So he says, you got it wrong. And when he says you got it wrong and proves that they got it wrong, the very next letter written a week and a half later, back to this gentleman says, you know what? I never, basically, I never saw it that way. You're right, we got it wrong. And then they have a negotiation of what it should be. So we have the, the the only document where the head of the team says, this is how I made that translation. And when he gets pushed back on, he says, I see your point. Should it be this or this? And then they, and when the team comes back together and, and translates for the revision in, the, in 1971, they don't pick the word homosexual, which is a, a group of people. They pick sexual perverts, which heterosexuals, I have met some, that are actually sexual perverts. I mean, I know that's impossible for a Christian heterosexual to believe, but it, it happens. And so they changed it. But the problem was that four other translations of the Bible were using the RSV. And then the other part is they had made 300, they looked through 300 suggested changes in June of 1959. They agreed with the publisher not to make any more changes. That contract, which I also have from the microfilms, I can prove everything. That contract said on October 1st, no more changes for 10 years. October 1st, 1959. David wrote his letter October 22nd, 1959. It's a, it's a, it's a 
fascinating story. Yes. Kathy, Kathy, I also like the point of the pastoral magazines and how uh, pastors were talking about counseling LGBTQ mm -hmm. people and how it shifted and changed. Do you maybe want to mention that a little bit? Because I think that's interesting. So in the 1940s, so I mean, I have a, 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 a mind that just says, why is that? Why is that? Dig, 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 dig. So it, it's a benefit. It was a problem as a child to my, my mother, but it's a benefit now. So um, I have gone through psychological journals, but I've also gone through Christian journals and Christian counseling journals. Christian counseling journals started in the 1940s. And you can either word search them or turn page by page, which is what I did because I can't just word search homosexual or I can't just word search Corinthians because how verses are used is completely different. But when I started searching through Christian psychological journals and Christian journals, I could absolutely, it took me weeks to do it. I could see that the, even though 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 said homosexual, nobody was using it as a, as a weapon against gay people because the thought right through 1973 when it's depathologized by the, by the APA is that this is a mental illness, it's a sickness. So you can't, you can't exactly, like you don't throw uh, epileptics into jail. I mean, they've got a sickness, right? You recognize that there are things that, um, and I'm not equating the two, but it's a different thing when it's a sickness. So at different points, homosexuality was a sickness or it's a crime or it's a sickness and a crime. But all the way through, nobody had to do anything with those verses because society took care of it. The, the legal system took care of it. But when it gets depathologized, that's the problem, right? Because now there's nothing wrong with it. So with the influx or the, uh, the influence of politics and the necessary, uh, the, the need to draw people into the voting booth, these untapped people into the voting booth, you've got to find another enemy. So homosexuality, <clears throat> no longer a crime, no longer a sickness, they make it a sin. And so there's the difference. And you see that reflected in the journals starting in the 1970s. Nobody was saying, oh, oh, poor homosexual, this is a sin. You need God to help you change. Wasn't like that. You have a mental illness, you have a sickness, go see a therapist. Not you need, you need Jesus to change you. That conversation starts in the 1970s. Could I also ask, um, we have um, refugees who come here, particularly from Africa, from Christian backgrounds in Africa, who have had exorcisms. Does that still happen in the States where it's believed that there's a, a demon of homosexuality that needs expelling? You wanna take it, Rocky? I still hear that, I still see that all the time, yes. Uh, you know, there's always, it's always a demon, you know? Um, so yeah, that rhetoric is still around, unfortunately. Yeah. It doesn't and it's, work. And it's, and it's different parts of Christianity, the, the more um, Pentecostal uh, fundamentalists, they'll still study demons. Like I, part of the work I do is I also review anti-LGBTQ books written by Christian authors. And they're all over the place. Some of them try to do it through relationships. Some, some try with their sloppy theology, but some are, everything's about a demon. It's still, everything's about a demon. And so demon, demon, demon on every page. I mean, nobody takes personal responsibility for anything. So it's all over the place. So, and they don't even agree with each other. There's one guy whose book I read that said, um, he brought someone, someone was brought to him with a demon of homosexuality. And he cast it out and he said, but he better keep coming back every Sunday because according to him, there's at least 10,000 demons of homosexuality. So like you keep coming back and you keep tithing and maybe one day we'll get that right one out of you. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got a question from Peter Anderson. 
Can't hear you, Peter. Can't hear you. I, uh, I, yes, thank you. I posted the question in the chat. Thank you for this forum. I, I'm going to have to depart uh, soon from uh, chilly and snowy Minnesota in the upper Midwest. Um, but um, I was just wondering, you know, what, what would be a better translation or a more correct, a correct translation then? I mean, our saying that ko koatai, you got to use some kind of English word for it. And what would a better English word be? You mentioned sexual pervert. That doesn't sound very inviting. <laughs> but you know, we want that, to, we want to be linguistically <laughs> accurate. Yeah. Actually, I think Eugene Peterson's The Message hits it. And it's not a word. The problem is because it was written into a culture where sex was used to demean and to abuse and to control people and sex was had to be procreative and you couldn't enjoy it, all those things, right? I mean, we don't do any of that stuff anymore. So um, heterosexual sex today is not biblical sex. So, uh, so you have to take into contact what they were trying to say. They were trying to say, don't use your sexual power to, um, to control people, to, to abase people, to treat them like women, right? So I think that Eugene Peterson's is the best and he says, those who, the people that won't go to heaven, the list, it says homosexuals, but it's, I think it should say, those who use and abuse others in general, those who use and abuse sex. I think okay. that is a good one. Okay. All That's right. a good one. Okay. So it, it's not just a word because it has to be contextualized into a modern context. Mm -hmm. Because to treat okay. someone like a woman doesn't fly right now like right or to penetrate somebody it, to penetrate somebody is not abusive sex was something you used to do to somebody not something you did with somebody sex is different than first century sex the whole all of it's different okay. all right thank you thank you helpful yeah um just one another way to even can come to the eugene peterson's definition there, right? The use and abuse of others and use, of, use and abuse of sex. When I was talking with our Roman historian yesterday, um, we were talking about the sibling oracles because he's done some work in them as well. And that's one of the ancient documents that lists our Sinecoitae. And the only way to really get a good definition of it is to see it used in, in other literature. And so I asked him about it yesterday. And, you know, the response was, even though our Sinecoitae is man better, you know, it's not necessarily betting with other men, but what he said is you have to understand that these are, if you look at the lists, both the lists in Corinthians and the list in the um, sibling oracles, these are habitual acts. These are things that are, people are doing to excess. These are things that people are doing in public. So if people did have love homosexual relationships, it was all in private and people didn't really care so much what you did in your own home. But these weren't about sex loving acts. These were about abusive, exploitative acts that were boastful, that were uh, against Roman culture, you know, as far as like um, what is acceptable and what they were, you know, yeah. leaning toward. So you know, those are the, some of the notes we're going to try to hopefully express in the film so people can understand why our Sinecoitai does not equal homosexual and really what it, what's going on there. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And I do have to excuse myself, but this has been very informative. A good day to you all. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Any more questions? Uh, yes, Rich. Hello. We can't hear you yet. Thank you all for putting this together. And uh, I have found this topic fascinating and Kathy absolutely fascinating uh, since I first met her. Um, I, I'm thinking of politics, you know, there is the generally accepted mainstream media uh, version of things that most people will adhere to. And it's the fringes that, uh, you know, whether or not it's uh, conspiracy theories or whatever, you know, that's all viewed as the fringe. I feel like that it's flipped around here that most of the churches adhere to the mainstream media version of Christianity and that we are on the fringes trying to show them what, you know, show them the, 
uh, the actual truth. And uh, you know, from an analytical perspective and an empathetic perspective, yeah, uh, I don't see how anyone could review all this information and not see that that's uh, that it's the truth, as opposed to well, I was taught differently, and I think that you're on the fringe, and I'm going to continue following what I was taught as from the time I was a child. So how can uh, yeah, I, I see this this movie and Kathy's next book as additional very powerful tools in the arsenal to try and flip that around so that um, this perspective becomes uh, the, the, the truth and the actual uh, mainstream version of religion and homosexuality. I don't and know if you have any comments on that. And what we can't forget is it's not just the academics or the politics around it, but there's real families dealing with this, right? So for instance, I think one of the most powerful groups of advocates, certainly in the United States, are they're called mama bears. And I remember about five years ago, those mama bears, there were maybe a thousand of them online, a couple of hundred, a thousand. And then they exploded. When I last looked about two weeks ago, one group of mama bears, they're secret Facebook groups, you can get into them, but you have to be let into them, is 91,000 moms, mostly Christians. They are in every single denomination, every single state and country. And they're in most churches. They are in most churches. And when their child comes out and they, have, they were with this child yesterday when this child was a straight kid, and they are with this child today when this child is a transgender kid. And those mama bears are fierce and they are getting educated. They're not only doing relationship, obviously, but they're getting educated and they are in all of those places challenging their pastors, challenging the other moms in their you know Tuesday night Bible study group. Those moms are doing it. So they, they, are, they are wonderful advocates. So we can't forget that within the church itself, people are challenging the churches and the pastors. And there will come a time when those people have enough of a voice in a church, when enough people come into the pastor and say, you need to reconsider this because pastors know about money. Pastors know all about money. And there's that, the, the case of the, the school in, in, in um, Australia just this week, where the, ch the church school has said all the, pa all the teachers and all of the parents have to sign off within a week this, this, this form that says they will not by, abide by letting their children present as trans or LGBTQ within the school system. They got a pushback immediately and, and that's gonna that's gonna hit them in the money. And it's gonna ha the same thing is gonna start happening in churches, but it's happening from within the church. It's not just happening where we're challenging people academically. People are challenging pastors relationally and it'll happen with money. It's gonna turn, but there will always be the ones that, you know, they still don't think white and black people should be married. <laughs> that's crazy enough. <laughs> Right? Like an aircraft carrier, it doesn't turn on a dime. It takes no. a long time to nudge it in a different direction. Yeah. It'll take time, but I, you know, I do feel strongly that we're, we will see change. And I, I, as the director of the film, have worked in knowing both sides and having empathy for both sides. And as we were talking about earlier, believing that our parents and our loved ones are victims of bad theology like us, my job was to and is to keep that audience watching the movie. Can we get them to watch the movie? Can we get them to the theater? Can we get them to behind on Netflix or if we're lucky enough or wherever we get to screen and sit through the movie? And so I have taken great care and thought in that audience and what questions they will have as it's going through, as we're going on this journey together, what would they ask and where would they get turned off uh, and again, leading with, um, you know, it's not an us versus them. It's not a you're right, we're wrong. We're in this together kind of thing. Um, these are just people and then the journalistic facts. So once you meet the people, can we get into the facts 
And then the third act, what do we do with this information? And also leaving the information on the table, it's not, again, not pumping it into your into your reality where this is, you know, you have to believe this way. And then the last thing I want to say is it's not an attack on anybody's faith. It's also not an, a, a film where we're trying to evangelize people into Christianity. It's about Christians that ask this question that take us on this journey and in the evangelical church. So we're not attacking God or anyone's faith. We're investigating a mistranslation. So. And the wonderful thing about being partnered with Ed and I being partnered with Rocky and her team is we have a lot of those same um, sentiments about we're just trying to educate people to bring them along because I believe the same thing too, because I was there. We are trying to educate people and give them information so that they can make better decisions. I know in my first book, I was unbelievably careful. Um, so this one, Walk the Bridges Canyon, I was unbelievably careful about my tone. And even when I read it as an audio, the first time I could hear tone in it. And I didn't want that. I wanted people to feel like I was just giving them information that maybe they hadn't had before so that they could make a different decision if they wanted to. And so we have that same um, sensibility as we're approaching this project. So I know the second book will be that the same thing. It'll, it's not an accusation. I don't think you'll be able to read between the lines where somehow I'm saying to you, if you don't know this, you're stupid. Or if you think this way, you're stupid. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen in the movie. It's not gonna happen in the book. So we really are about educating people and correcting errors. Thank you. That's now, what we want. Um, yes, no, I think that's a, that's, a wonderful, um, that's a wonderful way to approach it. And it's very inclusive because you know, rather than sort of pushing back, you're actually embracing, um, you know, the, the the journey of the other side. Because if we sort of take it back to sort of, you know, Kathy, if you could go back and speak to the you before your, um, you know, before your divorce, before Neto, um, like, you know, sort of how, and, and think about like, you know, so how would you convince that Kathy mm -hmm. to come along this journey? And it's like, you know, when the when the film comes out, when the book comes out, you know, when people are sitting down with their loved ones and and going through, you know, that with them, watching that and sort of asking those questions and having those conversations, it is a catalyst. It will create change. And, and it's I think it's wonderful that you're being very sensitive to the fact that, you know, the, the people who currently um, view it a certain way will themselves have to go through a journey um you know with with that information so i just want to say well done and, and you know thank you for having that empathy yeah I, I know that i know what would have worked for me which is why i wrote the first book and i and i know in converse you know having i've been now at this for 20 years uh and in having conversations with people i'm i'm more about like why do you think that way or have you ever heard of, or have you considered um, just those points of view? And even when I review anti-LGBTQ books, I don't go after the person. I try to go after their theology. Like they're missing this. They don't see this. This is not accurate. This is wrong. So I think the combination of the movie and the book, because we have the same tone is gonna be good. So when we end up on the same stage, yes, Rocky, we're gonna end up on the same stages. Um, of course we will. Um, we will, and Ed, Ed is the most lovely man on the planet. I say about Ed all the time. He's one of the kindest, most gracious people I know. I get to, uh, we're gonna be working on the book in about a week and a half for a few days in LA, in the LA area. And I just know how he will treat me like a treasure and you know love because that's it and it will come out in the movie he is a wonderful man so we've got, and then when you meet reverend david in the movie it's this we are a group of people where we're really kind of ordinary people and we're all i think don't you rocky i think we're all kind people I mean, I don't know if y'all noticed I was crying during the work samples. I've seen the movie like hundreds of times, obviously, over the last year. 
And I love all of you so much, Kathy, Ed, and David. I still cry at the end of the movie every single time. And obviously I'm very emotionally attached to it. I try to separate myself, you know, but the stories I just love. So I can't help it. I'm waterfalls every time. That's not feelings though. <laughs> but they're, but you, you, they're, they're, they're just so sincere. And I really think we captured it and it shows in the movie. So I hope that people will respond the way that I do um, for the love from these characters. And David, David is a one, you, you cannot help <clears throat> but fall in love with this man. And even that is a miracle. So he wrote this letter in 1959 under his first and his middle name from a PO box in Canada. And we had this miracle worker, Tina. It's a bigger story, but I worked with her and said, can you help me find this man? She's a search angel. She's a search angel online, tries to find families for people. And so she does this as her good works. She's a lesbian that likes to stay at home, has a bit of social anxiety, doesn't wanna be out. She's perfect for this job and she's my friend. So we gave her this, the information from this letter. It took her almost 11 months and unbelievable sleuthing. You'd never, how, how do you find a, a person that wrote a letter 60 years ago that used their first and middle name from a PO box? It's a great story. So she finds him and then 60 years later after this, this letter is written, I call him up on an August morning and basically say, hello, did you write a letter 60 years ago? And I find out that my suspicion when I read this letter, I said, this has got to be a gay man. A straight man could not have written this letter. Not in the 50s, not possible. <laughs> and the hour and a half into this conversation, I finally have enough rapport with him that I ask him the magic question. Can I ask you, are you gay? Yes, I am. 80 years old. When did you come out? I've never come out. He was wow. still in the closet. He had served 37 years in the United Church of Canada, and he had been partnered 23 of those years. He had been in nine pastorates. He was retired, and he was alive. So we've got him in the story. It's a great story. It's a great story. Thank you. So we're all looking forward to it. Well, I'm sorry, we're going to have to come to an end, aren't we? Um, but um, yes. Can I add one more thing? Because we are still trying to finish the movie. Yes. We are in our last leg. We are still fundraising for the movie. We need about $100,000 to get through technical post-production. We do have three fundraisers and pre-private like private screenings planned in select cities in the United States coming up. But if anybody did want to help us, you can buy merch, which is a great way to support. You can follow us on social media and share the content. If you don't have any money to donate, please spread the word. But we do have a fiscal sponsor for anybody who wanted to donate on a larger level in the United States. It's a tax de deduction called Women Make Movies or a uh, GoFundMe if anybody wanted to just throw us five bucks, 10 bucks to help us reach our goal. So all of that information is on our website, 1946themovie.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Um, and we have to say goodbye. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.